Hello, welcome to review part one. I'm your host, Mr. McMahon. Uh, some of this is already filled out from in class. I'm going to go ahead and work on the other half of the problems from this review. And then I'll also post another video for part two of the review, and I'll go through the other half of the problems there as well. All right, so we'll go ahead. Let's not waste any time. All right, let's start with um, the simplification problem. So, so the strategy for <clears throat> problems like this, there's a couple of rules of thumb that you can remember. One rule of thumb that I'd like to point out is with tangent and cotangent, it will pretty much help you every single time to turn tangent into sine over cosine. Or if you see a cotangent, right, to turn that into cosine over sine. All right, so to do something like this is probably going to help you. Uh, and in this case, if we turn tangent into sine over cosine, we can multiply those two together. Right, so that we end up with sine squared x over cosine of x. Now, another rule of thumb pretty much always helps you is if you notice a fraction plus something else, if you have them separated from each other, you probably want to go ahead and combine them into a single fraction. And so what we can do is we can multiply this by cosine over cosine so that we get a denominator of cosine, and that way we can add these together. So we get cosine squared over cosine plus sine squared x over cosine of x. Now, if we combine these together, we have cosine squared plus sine squared. We know that that's equal to 1, and the denominator is cosine. Well, what is 1 over cosine? That's secant of x. And there we go. That's as far as we can go. Looks like we did this one already in class. All right, we got an answer of secant cubed. Uh, that one we got an answer of 1 All right, by turning that secant into 1 over cosine. Let me go ahead and do this one. <clears throat> this one's also a good example because it gives us sort of another rule of thumb. And that is... If you see something like this, right, sine of pi over 2 minus x or cosine of pi over 2 minus x, you probably want to go ahead and use the identity for it. And what is sine of pi over 2 minus x? That is the same thing as cosine of x. Right. And that actually helps out a lot right? because cosine times cosine is cosine squared of x. And this is nice as well, right? 1 minus cosine squared, that's going to be equal to sine squared. Right? How do I know that? Well, it comes from this identity right here, right? Subtract sine squared on both sides. This one, right? Subtract sine squared on both sides. You get that cosine squared equals 1 minus sine squared. So you need to be able to manipulate identities so that you can make these substitutions. All right, let's go over here. Remember that rule of thumb I went over a couple problems ago, right? We have a cotangent here. Let's go ahead and turn that into cosine over sine. Again, that's probably going to help us here. Okay, it looks like I can go ahead and multiply those two, right? Turns into cosine squared over sine of x. And you know what? While I'm at it, I can tell I have a fraction plus something else. We probably want to go ahead and combine these two. So what should I do? Let me get a common denominator by multiplying by sine over sine. 
All right. What is that going to give me? It's going to give me cosine squared of x over sine of x, right? That just stays the same. The second term becomes sine squared x over sine of x. And just like that other problem not too long ago, right? The cosine squared plus the sine squared, that turns into 1. So we have 1 over sine of x which that is cosecant of x. And you can even tell, right, like this problem here and that problem there have a kind of similar structure to them. So we should kind of expect to get something similar for the answer too, right? They sort of simplify in the same way. Um, it looks like we already did this one, right, by you know, messing with this secant and this cosecant, right? Turned them into one over cosine, one over sine squared. And notice, right, how we turned this. If you go, if you use the red steps, right, we turn this into tangent squared. And we used an identity for this, right? Tangent squared plus one does equal secant squared, right? That's just, that's just up at the top here. Where is it? It's right there, right? So that's why it's important to have these identities on the note card right next to you. So, you know, you can just look over there, see if you recognize something. All right, so uh, what do we do about this? This one minus sine squared over cosecant squared x minus one. Um, well, you might notice, and there's a couple ways you could do this, um, but one thing you might notice is 1 minus sine squared, we know this is cosine squared x, right? That comes from an identity. What do we know about this? Well, let's look at our list up there. What identity has cosecant in it? This one. And notice if I subtract one on both sides, I get that cotangent squared is equal to cosecant squared minus one, right? So that hold on to that. Cotangent squared is equal to cosecant squared minus one. Well, look what we have over here, right? Cosecant squared minus one, that's gotta be cotangent squared. Okay, so this is equal to cosine squared of x over cotangent squared of x. But what is cotangent squared? Well, rule of thumb, always try to break up cotangent or tangent, right? Turn it into like sines and cosines. Well, this is going to be cosine squared of x over sine squared of x. And if you notice, right, these two will go cancel out. Right, cosine squared over cosine squared. Cancel, cancel. And the sine is sort of, you know, that fraction you're word dividing by is going to flip, right? So we end up with, looks like sine squared of x. Nice. All right. So those are all of the simplification problems and their answers. I just went through the three that we didn't get to in class. Depending on which class you were in, we, we did different ones, but these are all of the steps, the solutions. Uh, we also did some of these in class. Again, they might have been different depending on which class you were in. Uh, we're just going to go ahead and do whatever's left over here. So namely, I'm going to go over these two. Um, but pause the video, right, if you want to look at these steps. Um, so tangent of x equals negative square root of 3 over 1. Um, now, the 1 part down there isn't actually written there, but it is useful to think of this as negative square root of 3 over 1 because that allows us to use sort of SOHCAHTOA, right? it allows us to sort of view this square root of three as my opposite and this one as my adjacent. And um, we've also got to think about which quadrant we're in, 
All right, so let me draw a little coordinate grid here. If my tangent is negative, there's only two places I could be. I could either be in this quadrant or in this one. But notice they also tell me my sign is positive. Well, what is your sign of x? That's your y coordinate, right? Your y coordinate is positive. That could only mean that I am in this region here. Right? My triangle for Sokotoa is in that region, not in the one down there. So I'm going to go ahead. I'm in quadrant two. And, you know, an example of my triangle might look something like something like this. I have to be in quadrant true, two. We just proved it. And if my opposite is square root of three, well, you know, I'm going up here, right? So that's going to be a positive quantity. So square root of three. And because I'm going to the left, this is my negative quantity. Right, so this is negative 1. So tangent of theta is square root of 3 over negative 1. So really, in reality, this negative is actually applying to this 1 here, not necessarily the square root of 3. But anyway. So we know where our triangle is. I want to find the other trig functions, which means I need to know the hypotenuse. Well, let's use a little bit of Sokotoa, right? Square root of 3 squared plus negative 1 squared is equal to c squared. Well, this is going to be 3 plus 1 equals c squared. Okay, yeah. Looks like our c is going to be equal to 2, right? 3 plus 1 is 4. Take the square root you get 2 as the hypotenuse. And remember, for the sake of this type of problem, I can't necessarily explain why this is the case, but the hypotenuse will always be positive. It's never going to be negative. All right. So our hypotenuse is just 2. All right, so now let's get the rest of the trig functions. Right. So we have opposite, adjacent, hypotenuse. Let's just get the rest of them. Okay, well, cosine of theta is negative 1 over 2. Nice. Uh, secant of theta is just the reciprocal. So that's negative 2. Easy enough. Uh, sine of theta. Well, that's going to be radical 3 over 2. It's good stuff. Cosecant, well, that's the reciprocal, right? So that's going to be 2 over radical 3. We got to make sure we rationalize that, right? So multiply by root 3 over root 3, and you end up with 2 root 3 over 3. Okay, that's not too bad. We have tangent. We want to find cotangent, right? So just take this fraction and flip it. It's the reciprocal, so negative 1 over root 3. And if you rationalize that right, you get that this is equal to negative root 3 over 3. Just rationalize it. Right? Multiply by root 3 over root 3, and that's what you get. And that is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all six trig functions. Nice. Okay. Let's do this one. This one looks a little trickier. Um, notice again, we have tangent, right? So this is my opposite over adjacent. Now it's positive, right? So if you think about it, if we draw a little coordinate plane, there's, all, there's again two places this could be. This could either be in this area, the first quadrant, because that's where x and y are both positive, or we could be in quadrant three, because if x and y are both negative, then tangent is positive, right? This is your y divided by x. If we have a negative divided by negative, we get a positive answer. So that, those are the two spots we could be in. And now we use this piece of information. So cosecant is negative. Well, remember, 
cosecant is the same thing as 1 over sine. All right, well, sine is your y-coordinate, right? So this means 1 over y is less than 0 or negative, right? The only way that could be negative is if y is negative. That's the only way. So that must mean we're in quadrant 3, right? It's the only way. So we're in quadrant 3. Our triangle is down there. My opposite side, let's see. So let's say our triangle looks sort of like this, right? And this is theta. That would mean, right, because we're going a left and down, that we get negative 3 for this side and negative 4 for that side. Now, if you know your Pythagorean triples really well, you know what the hypotenuse is. Should be 5. 3, 4, 5, right triangle, right? And so now we can start answering these questions. So tangent, we already have that. What is sine? Okay, that's going to be negative 3 over 5. What is cosine? That's going to be negative 4 over 5. What is secant of theta? Well, maybe I should do cosecant first. Uh, let's see. What is cosecant of theta? That's going to be negative 5 over 3, just the reciprocal of sine. What is secant of theta? It's going to be negative 5 over 4. We already have tangent, right? And cotangent is just going to be the reciprocal, so 4 over 3. There we go. I'm going fast so that this video doesn't take an hour long. All right, I want to make this, you know, to the point. You can skip around to whatever section you have the most trouble with. And it looks like we've proven three of these. Um, just to sort of give a little summary here, right? So in this method, for this problem here, it looks like we distributed everything out and noticed <coughs> that this turned into cosine squared here and perfectly canceled with this minus cosine squared and we are left with this cotangent squared here. And that's one way to do the problem. Uh, you could also do it a completely different way as well, right? Notice, let me do it this other way. Notice that this first parenthesis, 1 plus cotangent squared, is the same thing as cosecant squared because that's an identity. And this 1 minus sine squared, we have an identity for that too. Right, that's cosine squared of theta. Well, let's look at what we have. Cosecant squared, what is that? That's 1 over sine squared times cosine squared. Okay, well, if you multiply those two together, you get cosine squared theta over sine squared theta. What is that? That's your cotangent squared. So another completely valid way to do this problem. You get the same exact answer at the end. Uh, over here, it looks like we used this technique here uh, in order to sort of get rid of the fraction sort of look to this, right? We're trying to get rid of the fractional form there. And so we did what we kind of vaguely call multiplying by the conjugate here. Right? So we multiplied by one plus sine of x. And when you do that, the middle terms cancel when you distribute all of it out. 1 minus sine squared became this cosine squared down here. And one of those cosines canceled with the one up top. Right? There's still one cosine at the bottom. right? And so we end up with this. And we divided through by cosine here and here to get this one and this one. And that turned into exactly what we were looking for, secant plus tangent of x. 
Uh, here, what we did was we divided through by cosecant squared. The first one turned into 1, right? Cosecant squared divided by cosecant squared is 1. And the second one turned into this fraction over here. Okay. Well, 1 over cosecant squared turns into sine squared. And then 1 minus sine squared turned into cosine squared. That's just an identity. So now let me go ahead and finish this one. You've got, a, you've got some options here about how you want to do this. Um, there's maybe three ways that I can think of to do this problem. I'll just do one of them. Uh, notice this right side only has cosine in it. And so one thing you could do is you could say, how do I get rid of this sine squared and replace it with something that has cosine in it? Well, we have an identity for that, right? But remember, this minus sign here, when you do the substitution, make sure to put parentheses because that minus is subtracting everything you are substituting out for. So sine squared is equal to what? 1 minus cosine squared of theta. And we are subtracting both, right? So this minus will distribute to both, right? And so... What do we get here? Well, we still have this cosine squared theta. The, when we distribute here, we get minus 1. When you, we distribute here, we get plus cosine squared theta. Okay, well, look at what we got. We got two cosine squareds and a minus 1. Well, that's two cosine squared theta minus 1. That's exactly what we were looking for. Perfect, right? What else could you do? Uh, well, here's maybe one other trick, although this might seem a little bit more difficult. What you could do is you could start on the right side and you could work with this minus 1, actually. I know it seems kind of weird, but this would still work. right? So you could turn this into 2 cosine squared theta minus something. Well, what is 1? It's cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta. I know it seems weird, but this is going to work. So the minus sine is going to distribute. We end up with 2 cosine squared theta minus cosine squared theta minus sine squared theta. Well, look at that, right? 2 cosine squared minus cosine squared. That turns into cosine squared theta. And look at this last piece, minus sine squared theta. That is a perfectly valid way to prove. We just made it look like the left side there. So anyway, just keep in mind, there's usually more than one way to the right answer. You just need to find one of them. Anyway, I'll go ahead and stop for this review part one. And uh, I'll go ahead and post part two later. And uh, hope you all have a good day.